Good morning. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. I'm just going to ask us to bow our heads in a word of prayer. And we're going to ask God to bless this Heavenly Father right now. We just pray that you're going to bring your anointing upon this message so that the words will sink deep into our hearts and that our spirits will receive it and we will be moved upon by your spirit. Thank you, Jesus. In thy name I pray. Amen. You know, there was a little girl and she was playing with her dolls and suddenly she began crying quite profusely. Her mother came over and sat down by her and said, Honey, why are you crying? She said, Because I keep loving my dolls, but they never love me back. You know, I just wonder if that's the way God feels about us sometimes. I've been uh, asked to speak on the subject of how to respond to God's great love. There are so many ways to respond to God's love, but I have chosen four ways that I want to talk about today. Um, and the first thing is thanksgiving, praise, and worship, because He deserves our worship. So I'm going to ask us to turn to Psalms 100. We're going to read the whole psalm. There's only five verses. It says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Uh, another rendering says, Sing unto the Lord, all ye lands. Verse 2, Serve the Lord or worship the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his courts with praise and be thank with thanksgiving, I'm sorry, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his mercy or his loving kindness is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. You know, uh, when we first came to Singapore in 55, we came to relieve uh, another missionary couple. And after they came back, we went and started our own uh, work. So it must have been about 1957, perhaps then, 56 or 57. Anyways, um, we found a place that we were going to hold the services in. And then, um, you know, I had to go out. Once, I went out once a week because I had a family to look after as well, knocking on doors, witnessing, testifying, inviting people to come. And there was this uh, home that I knocked on, and when the man came to the door, I realized by the clothes that he was wearing, um, they looked like a blue Samfu outfit, more or less like a fisherman's outfit. In those days, I realized him wearing that kind of an outfit, I knew he didn't speak English. So I began to speak in Chinese to him. And I told him, I've come to share Jesus with you. And uh, the minute he heard the word Jesus, he looked at me and he said, I am a Buddhist. And, you know, he traced his uh, back to China, his mother, his father, his grandfather, and in Chinese says, Wo zu 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 zong. You know, in other words, all my ancestors way back in China, they've all been Buddhists, and I'm going to be a Buddhist till I die. And he slammed the door in my face. I was really crushed, I remember. To try to cut a long story short, uh, I, I really, I told my husband, he, he'll never make it to heaven. He, he was so terrible. He was so rude. Of course, in those days, I, I was still young, and I didn't know how great the love of God was. But uh, the Lord had a sense of humor because it was one of our very first converts happened to be his daughter. But of course, I didn't know that it was his daughter. And one day she came to me and she said, Sister Seward, my father's been taken to the hospital and would you please go and visit him? He doesn't speak English. Take your Chinese Bible to witness to him. He doesn't know Jesus at all. You know, when I got there, found his 
bed number and the room number, the bed number, and as I walked near him, our eyes met each other, and he said to me, I am a Buddhist, and I said, I remember. You know, I, I went regularly. Every week I went to visit him. He would not allow me to speak about Jesus. I could make small talk, how are you, have you eaten, things like that, but he would not let me talk to him about Jesus. So for the second time, I kind of gave up on him, and I just told my husband, I'm wasting my time, he's just not interested to hear, and, and I, I didn't go back. After a couple more weeks, um, the daughter came to me and she said, my father is asking where is that white lady, why she doesn't come to visit me. Uh, and, and he is very bad, Sister Seward. They've pulled the curtains around him. They don't expect him to live. So I had to repent before the Lord and ask God to forgive me. And my husband drove me there, I remember. When we got there, they were already taking the blood because they'd been giving him blood transfusion. They were taking that away because they said they were expecting him to die probably that very night. So when I got there, I had to go into those curtains. He was propped up on the bed uh, with quite a few pillows. He was so weak, he was so emaciated, you know, and um, cheeks were just almost like holes here, skin over the bones. And uh, in a very soft voice, he said, you know, I'm a Buddhist. Oh my goodness. My heart just almost went down to my feet and I thought, this man is just almost impossible. But he didn't stop there. He said, you know, I, I'm now facing death. And he said, my Buddhism isn't helping me at all. And I, I just want to know, will, can your Jesus help me? And I said, yes, my Jesus can help you. You know, I didn't start preaching to him at all because the Bible says, whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What if I'm trying to preach to him and explain all this uh, to him and, and, you know, he dies? No, no, I immediately said, you follow me in this prayer. And, and I began to pray uh, in Mandarin, he, though he spoke Tao Chu, um, or Hokkien, I can't remember which, but he, he followed me, he followed me. And, and I got to the part where, uh, you know, I believe that Jesus died for me and he shed his blood for me and please cleanse me with your precious blood, wash away my sins. And then I, I was rather tired and I stopped to kind of take a breather, and, but I heard him continue to pray. So, you know, I opened my eyes and I looked at him and um, his two hands were raised up to heaven and the tears were rolling down his cheeks. And, and I heard him say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, because now I am your son. Now, who told him when you accept Jesus, you will become a son of God? The Holy Spirit had to witness that to his heart. But the reason I tell this story is, you know, the moment he was born again, that born again spirit knew to start thanking God for what he had done, for washing away his sins, for coming into his life, for making him a child of God. And friends, this is one way that if we're really born again, deep down within our spirits, we know that we need to thank him, praise him, and worship him. Uh, he not only deserves our worship, he alone is worthy of our worship. Let's look at Revelation 4, 11. It says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created.
The second point is reading and meditating on his word. I see this as feeding on his love. This new man, this inner man, this uh, new spirit that God has given to us when we're born again needs to feed on his love. Uh, my daughter was suggesting to me, she said, you know, when two people are in love, how they, they want to receive and read communications of love. In the old days, that means when I was young, we called them love letters. Nowadays, everybody uses their phone, so I suppose they would text these love messages back and forth, and they, they'll look forward to it. They, they never erase them. They never get rid of them. They go over and over and read it and reread it. And I would just like to suggest that God's Word is His love letter to us, and we need to feed on His love by reading it daily. The second reason to read and meditate, that means mull on it, think about it, dwell upon it, you know, is because it strengthens our inner man. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace, that's the life of God, it's, we, it's undeserved. For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. Faith is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. The moment God sees the desire within us uh, to receive salvation, he drops this faith. It's his gift to us and drops it into our hearts. It says it's not of works, salvation, lest any man should boast. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him romans 10:17 says so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god so you see as we read god's word it builds our faith, and without faith, there's no way to please God, all right? So actually, we are feeding our inner man, our spirit man. We are strengthening it as we read it. My mother was a missionary to China, and uh, she prayed this prayer to God. She said, Lord, I'm out here winning the Chinese people to the Lord. How can I be ensured that my own children, there were three of us at that time, my own children will know you and follow after you. And, and God answered her <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and told her, feed them on my word. Feed them on my word. And so from that day on, we started having daily devotions where she would read to us. <clears throat> she didn't read Bible stories out of Bible story books. She read old King James. And, you know, every day she read a chapter to us till we would finish a complete book. Not only did we have a reading of the word, she gave us scripture to memorize. Every day we memorize one verse till we would memorize whole portions of scriptures. Like the, I was only four years old when I'd already learned um, the 34th Psalm, which is quite a long Psalm, by just memorizing one verse every day and adding that to the one before. So, you know, and out of the three of us, we all serve the Lord full time till the day uh, the other two have already gone to be with the Lord. But, uh, and I'm 89 and I'm still serving the Lord. And I really owe it to the fact that my mother took time to feed us on the word, explain the word, and that created a hunger in us for more. Um, the third point is how to respond to the Lord 
is obedience to the Lord. John 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience is our walk of life and is a proof of our love to God. All right. Um, it's not how much we do for him in the church. It's not how much we attend the church service, but it's how much do we obey his commandments. Let's look at John 15, starting with 9. It says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So obedience, not, you know, reading God's word feeds us on his love, but obeying him helps us to abide and remain in his love. Even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So as we obey him and walk in obedience, which shows our love in return to him, all right, uh, that causes the joy of the Lord to abide in us and be full in us. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, how does God love us? In Romans 5, 8, it says, God commendeth his love toward us or demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He demonstrates his love, not mere words, but in action with an unconditional love, with an everlasting love. He looks beyond our faults and he sees our needs and he's always ready to forgive us when we have done wrong. He never holds things against us. He will convict us, he will prompt us, prod us, to get us to admit our wrongs so that he can forgive us, all right? Um, I, I remember many years ago, there was this uh, lady, she was a Methodist lady. She came to me and she said, uh, Sister Seward, my daughter has been in the university studying to be a doctor. But as they began to study different diseases, she suddenly started having uh, this, whatever it was, I don't know what it's called, but every disease they studied, she started getting uh, symptoms of that disease and, and thinking that she had that disease. Of course, she had to drop out of school. And she asked, could, could my daughter come and stay at your house so you could observe her and uh, pray with her and maybe help her to find healing so you know i i took care of her i put her in our guest room in the guest bed but saturday when saturday came along i had been invited to go preach someplace and so i didn't know what i was going to do because my husband had to be in the office and i i knew that i couldn't take her because she was always quite like sickly and always staying in the bed. My two daughters who were teenagers at the time, my two eldest daughters came to me and said, Mama, it's all right, we'll, we'll take care of her. You just uh, go, you know, and um, you preach and we, we know what to do. You, you, are you sure? Yes, they, they were sure. But you know, when I drove back after preaching, as I drove the car into the yard, my second daughter came running out and uh, I rolled down the window for her and she showed me her arm and, and there were claw marks on it from long fingernails and blood had come out of the skin. 
I saw that and I felt my heart just kind of go like that. And my daughter said, Mama, you, you, don't, you think this is bad. You should see poor Deb. Uh, she took her by the hair and bonged her head against the, the, the wall. And I heard that and, you know, uh, my heart even went further. I never said a word, but this thought came. You know, it wasn't till years later I realized that thought was not my own. That was a demonic thought. It was a prideful thought. The thought was, Sister Seward is here now. Everything is all right. I should never have accepted that thought. Number one, the reason I came to the conclusion that wasn't my own thought, because I wouldn't call myself Sister Seward. And it was a third party speaking to me. And it definitely wasn't God speaking to me. He wouldn't say because Sister Seward's here. It was the devil putting a prideful thought there, and I received it. You know, the moment I received that prideful thought, it definitely threw me off guard. I went in very carefully into the bedroom where she was and asked, how are you doing? And she began to beckon to me to come. But she talked in a very low voice, I, and I'm hard of hearing, and I couldn't hear, and I asked her, please speak louder. But she just kept beckoning me to get closer, to get closer, and she kept her voice very uh, soft. And I, I leaned down to hear more clearly what she was saying, and the next thing I knew, I felt these sharp fingernails go around my eyeball. Of course, my eyelid had shut when it saw that hand coming. It was just a split second. So my eyelid was there, but I felt those claws. Her fingernails were long. They went around my eyeball, and I didn't try to fight. I didn't try to argue. I just laid my head on her chest, and I just was still, you know, like a dog that gives up a, a fight. And as I just lay there, my heart was pounding inside of me. I was crying out to God and saying, Oh God, please, please answer my prayer. Please don't let her harm me and help me. And I felt her hand begin to relax. And once I felt those fingernails begin to relax around my eyeball, I jerked away from her. The moment I got away from her, <clears throat> That fear turned into anger. Oh, I was just boiling hot. I got up from that bed. My arms were very strong in those days. And I just grabbed her and I pulled her out of bed. I had her pinned into the corner of the bedroom. And I, I was just, with my mouth, I was scolding her. And, you know, and my husband came back from the office. As he walked by the room, he saw me and he said, Marge, stop that. And I, of course, it, it you know, shocked me and I, I, I let go. He came in the room and he said, you need to apologize to her. I said, apologize to her? You don't know what she did to the two girls and what she did to me. She should apologize to us, not me apologize to her. And, and um, my husband didn't argue. He just said, let's hold hands and pray. So the three of us stood there in a little mini circle and uh, held hands. And he said, now, Marge, you, you lead out in prayer. Me lead out in prayer when I'm so angry? I don't know what I'm doing. And um, I said, you pray. So he didn't argue. He just started praying. And I shut my eyes. And the three of us are holding hands as he prays. And just then I heard this very sweet, soft voice say to me, this will be the last time I can fellowship with you. And I knew it was Jesus. And in my heart, 
I just, but Lord, why? Why aren't you going to fellowship with me? I love my time of fellowship with the Lord. Why aren't you going to fellowship with me? This is all internal. And Jesus said, if you're not willing to admit you're wrong, if you're not willing to ask for forgiveness and say you're sorry for the way that you have behaved, I can't fellowship with you anymore. He didn't say that I wouldn't be a child of God anymore. It takes a lot more than one or two things like that to, to really break that relationship. But the fellowship, I tell you, I stopped right there. I, I interrupted my husband's prayer, in fact, and, and I turned to this lady and I just said, please forgive me. I haven't behaved like a child of God should behave. I haven't showed the love of God to you at all. Please forgive me for the way I've acted, behaved, and what I've done to you. So, um, you know, I, I learned a, a great lesson there that, you know, he has commanded us to love one another as he has loved us. Not based on the way they behave to us, but we are to love one another the way he loves us. Uh, the fourth point is love what God loves. Now God loves people as we all know by that verse that I think all of us know that verse John 3 16 for God so loved the world not the trees and the flowers he's talking about the people in the world for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life you see God loves people and he wants us to love people as well I'm recalling a time when uh, my husband brought a young man his name was David he was a weightlifter he was an American son uh, he was the son of American missionaries uh, to the Philippines and they had brought him to Singapore and, you know set him up in a business that's what he had wanted but um, people had taken him to the Batu caves in above Ipoh and uh, which is they do Hindu worship there and playing a prank or a joke on him they uh, you know led him deep into the caves and, and then ran off and left him there and the fear that gripped this young man, he was 20 years old, but, uh, you know, the, the fear that gripped him, he, he had a mental breakdown. How he got back to Singapore, I, I don't know that. But my husband was called to a hotel room where he, when he walked in, found this young man on the floor uh, sitting in a yoga position with his two wrists like this, uh, saying, who... Who hurt my body? He had used a razor blade and slashed himself, but he, of course, didn't know what he was doing. My husband brought him home to our home. I need to cut the long story short. Um, we started taking turns. First, he tried to do it on his own, but it was a 24-hour job, and we just realized my husband couldn't just do it on his own. So one day he would do it, one day I would do it, and it was my turn. And um, to to take care of him, and after I'd bathed him, you had to do everything for him. The only thing he knew how to do was eat, and um, and he knew how to do that. Anyways, I had brought him out, I remember, into the living room. I would got him seated uh, on the living, uh, in one of the easy chairs. Some, I was studying Tiao Chu, so somebody had given me a, a small um, tape recorder that I, I would play my tapes on to hear my teacher speaking. But I'd also bought some tapes that had Christian music on it. And, you know, and I, so I put some nice music 
on the tape recorder and put it on the windowsill and had him sitting in the chair. Uh, we didn't have a rug on the floor. The floor was terrazzo. And uh, I thought I could leave him just for one or two moments. I needed to go into the kitchen. And I was just going to enter in through the doorway into the kitchen when I heard crash, smash, bang. I swung around and uh, in time to see uh, David sitting back down in his chair. So I knew whatever it was, uh, he was responsible for it. And when I came running back in, there was my precious tape recorder. He had gone over, taken it from the windowsill and smashed it, threw it with all of his might on the floor. And of course, it was just smashed into smithereens. Uh, I came over to him. I, I put my finger under his nose and, and I said it through clenched teeth. Don't you... Ever. I'm not talking to David. I'm talking to the spirit inside of David that made him do this. Don't you ever do something like this again. Of course, there was no more tape recorders to break. But I, I could feel as I was talking through clenched teeth that uh, anger was rising up. So I left him. I didn't talk anymore because I didn't want to do anything where my anger might turn physical. I, I, I had never touched him, I'd never done anything wrong. And I went over and I sat down in a chair. I, I had been reading a book called Praise the Lord Anyhow. So I sat down and began to think, this is the time uh, to put this book into action. And, and I began to say, you know, uh, thank you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. And But then out of the other side of my mouth, oh, my tape recorder. And then I'd start crying. And then I'd start saying, but I thank you. I praise you anyways. And then, oh, my tape recorder, my tape recorder. After a few minutes of doing this back and forth, I heard God's voice so clearly. And this is what he said. You are crying over a broken tape recorder that you can go out and buy another one. I am crying over a broken soul that unless he is healed and mended, he will spend eternity in hell. And I began to weep and I began to cry. And I just realized, you know, God, we love things. We love things. It says you cannot serve God and mammon. God loves people. May that sink deep into our hearts. Love what God loves. We need to share God's love. You see, God has done so much for us. And I'm going to remind you of the story of the demoniac in Mark 5, 18 and 19. It says, and when he was come into the ship, you, you know how Jesus delivered him and set him free from all those demons that had bound him for so long. And when he was set free, he got into the ship. Uh, it says, when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him, prayed Jesus that he might be with him. In other words, I want to follow you. I want to go with you. I want to be one of your disciples that wherever you go, that I'm right there at your side. Verse 19, how be it, Jesus suffered him not, but said unto him, go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. So you can see here, God wants us to share the wonderful things that God has done for us with people who have never heard, with people who don't know the Lord, with, so that they too can hear about the Lord. Uh, you know, um, just this last year, there was a young man that joined one of my um, 
Bible college classes. And I prayed with him uh, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Later, and I noticed every Thursday he wouldn't come to school. But, or if he came, he came very late. And so one day he opened up and shared with me and also sh I asked him to share with the class. A and he told this story. You know, he grew up in a church that belonged, I mean, that um, knew God and people that were like a charismatic type of church. And he had been baptized, uh, they had, were baptized in the spirit, but not he, from young, he had heard it, but he himself evidently had never really received the Lord. But as he got a little older, uh, he was very musically inclined, and, and he began to play the guitar for church, other instruments. And uh, But after church, he would go out, and he actually got mixed up with a wrong crowd. He started ran running around with a gang. And soon, you know, he was in and out of prison, in and out of prison. And then something terrible happened, and the blame was put on him. And um, they charged him and put him away for five years. That night that he was locked in solitary confinement, the lights were turned off, and he fell on his knees, and he began to cry. He cried out to God and uh, began to ask God to forgive him. And he said suddenly, you know, his sins from very young, right up until one by one, they began to flash before him. And he asked God to forgive him, cleanse him. And one by one, as he confessed his sins that God was showing him, uh, he said when it was all over, the peace that came into his heart. And, and he went to sleep with such peace. When he woke up the next morning and the warden of the prison came by, you know, to check on him, he was so full of joy and he, he began to, you know, respond in such a respectful way and began, and the, what are you so happy about? And they began to witness, you know, when they let him out of solitary confinement, he began to witness to uh, the guards at the prison, he began to witness to his fellow inmates, and um, that five years, I don't, I can't remember if he spent the whole five years there, but he won many people to the Lord, sharing with them how God had changed him and what God had done for him. Um, so, love what God loves. Uh, he loves people. We need to share God's love. Uh, the third thing under love what God loves, we need to pray for the loss. First John chapter 2 verse 2 says, And he, that's Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. That's a big word. Propitiation means the, the sacrifice that fully atones, fully covers every all of our sins and not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world so you see Jesus didn't just die for you and for me it's wonderful that you and I have come to the Lord it's wonderful that our sins are forgiven but he died for the whole world and we need to really pray for them second Peter 3 9 says the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes we get tired of praying for people. We think, why, you know, uh, we pray and pray and pray and we don't see any change. Don't think that the Lord is slow to answer. Listen, I prayed for my second son, who as a teenager went away from the Lord. He had been saved, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but 
you know, he got in with the wrong crowd and he went away from the Lord. I prayed for 20 years for my son. And I refused to give up because God had given me verses and promises that he was going to bring my whole family uh, to the Lord. And, and I wasn't going to let go of that promise. But 20 years down the line, when it was time, God told my three daughters all at the same time, it's time for your brother to come back to me. And, and today, he is a minister of the gospel. So I'm here to say he's not slow, all right, concerning his promise. He's long-suffering. He'll put up with things, but keep being faithful to pray for them because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all. And, and there's a verse that tells us, you know, if you pray according to God's will, it will be answered. If he's not willing that any should perish, when you pray for the unsaved, when you pray for the lost, he's going to answer, all right? Second, uh, First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, all right? Uh, verse 2, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. You know, there were, and I believe God brought back this memory to me of this, these two elderly ladies that lived on a certain street in America. And uh, they, they were handicapped. Elderly, I don't know to what degree, but I just know they couldn't get out of the house that much. But they were real prayer warriors. And they began to pray for every household on that street that they lived on. They prayed for years. Year after year, they prayed. And one by one, each household came to the Lord until finally every household on their street, had, the people came to the Lord because of their prayers. In conclusion, let's look at that verse one more time, Romans 5, 8. God commendeth or demonstrates or proves his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us if he died for sinners he wants you and me to pray for sinners that they will come to him uh, let us respond to God's great love all right in these four ways I'm just going to um, caption these four so that we don't forget them. The first one is through thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Because he deserves our worship and he alone is worthy. And we need to thank him and praise him for all that he has done for us. The second thing is to read and meditate on his word which feeds our inner man, and it's we're actually feeding on his love. His word is a love letter to us. It will help to build us up. It will help to increase our love, increase our faith. The third thing, obedience to his word in a daily lifestyle, all right? The proof that we really, truly love him is shown through the fact that we um, obey his word and obey his commandments. And last but not least, to love what God loves, and that is people. To share with the lost 
and to pray for the lost. Oh, friends, shall we bow our heads right now and ask God to help you to respond if you're a child of God, if you're not yet. Because, you know, just like that boy that was born in a Christian family, later ended up in prison, he went to church every day of his life. And yet, and he even played music. It looked like he was a child of God, but he was not born again. And Jesus said, you must be born again. Otherwise, there's no way you can enter into the kingdom of God. Going to church alone is not going to help. Serving in the church, doing, you know, uh, different duties around the church, taking part in services isn't going to do it. You must be born again. Let's bow our heads, and I'm just going to pray a prayer of salvation for those who have never received him. Uh, Heavenly Father, right now, I thank you because you died for each and every one of us. And I pray, oh God, if there's even one person in the service today who still does not know you, who still has never been truly born again, as they pray, pray this prayer, oh God, forgive me, I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I cannot change myself. But Jesus, you died for me on the cross. You bore my sins. You paid the full price. You, God raised you from the dead after you died in my place. And today you are alive and can hear and answer prayer. Lord, apply your blood and cleanse each and every one of their wrongs, of their sins, of their failures and then Lord I pray for each of us that we might with the help of your Holy Spirit begin to follow you and respond to your great love that you loved us even when we were sinners you were willing to die for us may we be willing to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice to obey you and to love others and to share with others. Thank you, Jesus. In thy name I pray. Amen.